Doctor, please, tell me the truth. Emily was crying quietly and was in a kind of prostration. She, a strong woman who had her own business, albeit small, and had raised one son, whom the whole school was proud of, was now unable to speak coherently. The day began quite normally. She got up half an hour earlier than Alex, made an omelette and tea, looked at her watch, and mentally counted to five. Good morning, Mom. Alex showed up at the count of five. Emily was a punctual and obliging person herself, and she raised her son the same way. Good morning, son. Sit down for breakfast. Every morning went the same way. Over breakfast, they told each other what had happened the day before and shared their plans for the day. Emily loved the morning, because in the evening she sometimes came in when Alex was already asleep or so tired that there was no time to talk. Mom, I'll be later today. Where are you going? Alex blushed slightly. I invited Sarah to the movies, and then Emily realized Alex had grown up it was the last year of school. Of course, she did not really like Sarah. She was immodest, but her mother was not going to interfere. She didn't want to be the one to choose her son's bride. Need money? Alex smiled. No, Mom, you're already giving me too much for my allowance. I've got plenty saved up. Emily smiled. What movie, anyway? And that's where her son became confused. Mom, honestly, I don't remember. Alex expected his mother to calmly say that it was wrong and that such things should not be forgotten and so on. But she suddenly smiled and immediately hid the smile. Emily did remember something after her son's words, namely how she and his father used to go to the movies all the time so they could make out in the back row. No one knew what movie they were going to because they just didn't watch them, and then one day the power went out. They took everybody out of the theater with flashlights, and they hid and stayed in the theater until morning, and then Alex's father left. He left for his grandmother's funeral and said he would come back for her, but he never showed up again. Emily knew what city he lived in, knew his last name, but immediately decided that she would not humiliate herself, especially since Alex was already growing up in her. Michael arrived a year later. Emily opened the door and almost fainted when she saw him, and then said dryly, Don't ever show up in my life again. Michael frowned. You won't even listen to me. No, I'm not at all interested in your stories. She slammed the door and sobbed for two hours. It had been so long ago, and yet so recently. In the evening at seven o'clock, her phone rang. It was Alex. Strange, has he already gone to the movies? Yes, my son. Emily, it's Sarah. Alex was taken to the hospital. We were attacked by some thugs. Emily dropped the phone, then caught up and already on the run shouted into the phone. How is he? Sarah... Do not be silent. From the other end of the line sobs were heard. Bad, all very bad. I'm here at the hospital. Please come, he asked for you. Emily was not only punctual, she was also a good woman. She tried not to break the traffic rules, but today she was rushing through the city so that people and cars darted in different directions. By the time she reached the hospital, she was cursed by half the drivers. She saw Sarah in the lobby, rushed to her. Where is Alex? The girl jumped up. He was taken away for surgery. For an operation. What operation? Emily refused to understand anything. Well, they had a fight on the street, but what kind of operation could it be? Sarah lowered her eyes. One of the men had a knife. Emily clutched at her chest. Sarah rushed to her and shouted, Help! Help! The woman is sick! Next, Emily had some kind of blackout in her memory. Woke up already in the doctor's office. Why do you scare everybody so much, my dear? 
You have to control yourself. Your son really needs you. Emily sat down, rubbed her temples. Doctor, how is he? The man gave her a glass of water, and he sat down at the table. To be honest, I have nothing to cheer you up with. The wound is very serious. The knife not only grazed his internal organs, but also hit his spine. Your son was hit from behind. Of course, we repaired everything we could, but his condition is very serious. I can't give you any prognosis. Emily jumped up and ran to the doctor. What are you saying? It can't be. Alex is a young, strong boy. His exams are coming up. He is the best student at school. I brought him up alone, you understand, alone. He's the only thing I have. I have money. If I don't have enough, I'll sell everything. You tell me how much it takes to save my son. How much? Emily snapped into a scream, and the doctor pulled her to him, and she cried. Crying helps. Understand, it's not about money right now, not at all. What's important right now is how your body will behave. There's too much damage. I don't want to scare you, but I want you to know what to prepare for. In my experience, no one from this kind of injury has ever. No, doctor, no. Emily shook her head, not wanting to hear anything. May I go to him? Please let me in. Yes, I'll take you to him. And after these words, Emily became really scared. She knew very well that no one was allowed in the intensive care unit, only to say goodbye. Alex was somehow small. He was almost invisible among the tubes and machines. Emily knelt quietly in front of the bed. My son, my son, how is it so? Alex was silent. His white skin almost merged with the white linen. Only his dark hair somehow painfully stood out against this white background. She sat by his bedside for about half an hour. Emily didn't cry. She looked at her son, trying to remember every feature. Emily Johnson, no more, I'm sorry. The phone number appeared out of nowhere, and the woman flinched. Just one more minute, please. No, you can't, please. Let's go. Emily Johnson came out into the corridor and walked out. She silently, without seeing, walked past the light, and the girl sat down in horror. Alex's mother seemed to have aged twenty years in half an hour. Emily Johnson went out into the hospital yard. It was getting dark. She could hardly see the bench. Emily spent the last of her strength to reach it. She fell down and sobbed. Tears can't help grief. Emily thought she'd mishear it because no one was there just now. She took her hands away from her face and saw the old gypsy woman beside her. What did you say? I said that your tears wouldn't help a loved one. Emily looked at the gypsy woman. Maybe you know what can help my own person. I do. There was once another man in the same situation. He was your kin, too, but you decided you were proud. He got over it, wanted to love you, and you drove him away because of your pride. Now the situation is repeating itself. Find that man, bring him to your son. If he's there for you, your child will be fine. I don't understand. Please don't go. Who am I supposed to find? Your son's father. Wait. But the old Gypsy disappeared into the darkness as unnoticed as she appeared. I will find him. I will do everything I can to get Alex back on his feet. Emily rushed to the car. Without stopping at home, she rushed to her old acquaintance, whom she had not seen in ten years. He and Michael had once worked together. Michael left, and his friend stayed in the city. She rang and knocked on the door. For a moment she thought it was night, but Emily didn't care. Finally, the door swung open, and on the threshold stood a sleepy Paul. What was going on? Emily? He was so surprised, and there was no reason to be. They had not seen each other for ten years, if not more, 
and now Emily, disheveled and crying, pounded at his door with her fists. Paul, I'm sorry. I need Michael's address. You know, very urgently, very much. Paul wanted to say something, but kept silent and disappeared into the apartment. He came back with a piece of paper. Only I do not know whether he lives there. So many years have passed. Thanks, Paul. What happened to you? He answered. Paul, my son is in intensive care. Everything is very bad. My son and Michael's son. Paul's eyes widened, and Emily was already running down the stairs. The woman got in the car, scored the address in the navigator. It was 350 kilometers to the address, but nothing. She would be there by morning and Emily stopped the car in front of a beautiful house. You could see that the tenants were watching both the house and the yard, benches, a playground. The house was small, just a few apartments, but not old and very even decent. So the second apartment. Emily got out of the car with determination and headed for the entrance. The intercom blinked and beeped, but no one answered her. Please, come on, please, pleaded Emily. She turned around abruptly. Michael was standing in front of her. He looked at her in surprise, and the woman said, You have to come with me. He raised an eyebrow. With you? Where? What's going on? Michael, please, you have to come with me to my town. Right now. I'll explain everything on the way. Please. The man turned around at the car that was abandoned in the driveway. Did you just get here? She nodded. I was coming on purpose to get you. Her hands trembled, her voice trailing off. Keys. What? Where are you going to drive in your condition? I'll drive. They got in the car, and Emily suddenly asked. Maybe you need to warn someone. No. I have no one to warn. Now tell me what happened. The woman sighed. Now she would have to tell her that Michael had a son. I have a son. Half an hour later, Michael said through gritted teeth, Do you realize that you deprived me of communication with my child? How selfish you are. Me? Actually, you're the one who left me. Why did I have to let you know I had a child? Emily turned away and looked out the window. I didn't abandon you. When I got to my town, I saw three scumbags molesting a girl right at the train station. Of course I couldn't pass by, but it so happened that the forces were unequal. I saved the girl, but they cut me up pretty badly. For two months I was between life and death. I missed you very much, but no one called you because no one knew we were together. Did you? You didn't try to find out what happened to me. Then I was in treatment, recovering, and I was terribly offended by you. But I couldn't stand it, so I went by myself. You drove me away. That's the whole story. Michael wanted to add something else, but saw Emily struggling amusingly with sleep and simply said, Get some sleep. I remember where the hospital is. He was a little uncomfortable. He realized now that they were both good, both hot, irreconcilable. He never got married because he compared every woman to Emily. Apparently, she didn't marry for that reason either. They entered the hospital and immediately ran into the doctor. Emily Johnson, I was going to call you. The woman went pale, but the doctor hurriedly continued. Don't be frightened, please. I don't understand what's going on. But contrary to all assumptions, your son's condition is improving. Not quickly, but it's getting better. It's too early to guess, but something tells me that we're still going to fight it. Emily went outside. She and Michael spent a lot of time at Alex's bedside, and then Michael asked to leave him with his son for ten minutes. You see, Emily... I need to tell him that I am there for him now, and he can rely on me completely. Yes, I'll be outside waiting for you. She covered her eyes 
and noticed a skinny figure on the bench, looked closely. That's Sarah. The girl trembled and looked at Emily with frightened eyes. Sarah, didn't you go anywhere? The girl shook her head negatively. No. It was because of me, you know, I had guys picking on me. Emily stroked her head. Go home. Any normal guy would have done the same thing. Let's hope Alex pulls through. Michael said, feeling a little better. Sarah jumped up. Really? Is Alex really going to be okay? Tell me, am I allowed to come? You won't drive me away? Come, I won't. A voice came from behind Emily, and you've changed. A few years ago, you would have cursed that girl. Emily turned to Michael. You know, I learned a lot today. You have to love life and fight for happiness while not getting in the way of others. Michael smiled. Emily, I've missed you. Maybe we can try again?